focusing on fertility inequalities for the first day of our Awareness Week. And with us, we have Dr. Jane Stewart, who's chair of the British Fertility Society. And Jane is going to talk about some of the issues which can arise for fertility patients. Um, Jane, I think it would be really helpful if you could start by explaining what kind of treatment fertility patients ought to be able to get on the NHS in this country. So there's a, there's a variety of treatments, of course. So not everybody ends up with IVF treatment, but it's often IVF treatment that people worry about from the point of view of access. So um, the fertility patients ought to be able to receive a referral from their GP to a clinic to have an assessment of their fertility problems and a proper opinion about what might be going wrong and therefore what treatment would be recommended for them and what would be suitable, if anything. And I would hope that therefore then they could get access to that treatment. Um, in general terms, if you're thinking about things that are unlicensed, so not something that involves the human fertilisation embryology, the regulators, such as ovulation induction treatment, that, that's fairly straightforwardly um, received under a tertiary care. But then it gets to more complex things, IVF treatment, then obviously um, there are already well-known access issues. But the NICE guidance suggests that in that setting, people should have access to three cycles of treatment plus the frozen embryo transfers that go with that in order to give them a good chance of successful pregnancy. There are lots of things that aren't covered through that, the donor programmes and everything else. But in principle, what you would hope is that we would recognise that fertility is a real thing. It causes huge hardship for people and it should be treated appropriately. So why doesn't everyone get access to what they ought to at the moment? Well, I think um, there's always been this, this understanding about IVF or this sort of background thing about fertility that maybe it's not a, a, a real problem, perhaps it's a lifestyle thing. There's always been this kind of prejudice in the background that means that people don't always think of it as a, as a, as a serious medical issue and consequently um, historically IVF was frowned upon initially gradually developed into something a lot of it's undertaken in the private sector I think there's just this background feeling that it, it's expensive it's difficult it doesn't always work and and the people don't really need it you know you can manage without that if you don't need it um, and so I think that it just hasn't been well covered and in England in particular um, with individual commissioning groups, they're all able to make up their own minds about how they use their money and prioritise their money. And for some, it just hasn't been a priority. So as a fertility specialist, is it really hard when you're trying to offer people the treatment you think they might need? And you also have to look at their postcode to decide whether you're going to be able to say yes or no. You're quite right. In England in particular, it is a postcode thing, so the different commissioners can do that. For, for me personally, we're fortunate in the North East where I work that our commissioners work as a group across the but I have worked with different waiting lists in the past when, when we had CCTs and clearly it's a, a, across the country that's the case. So we might have people who move into our region um, who aren't commissioned immediately because our commissioners feel that they can't support people just moving around the country because it's not supported elsewhere and that's a fair comment. Um, so you, you, absolutely it, it, it's hopeless, it's horrible having to talk to people about the fact that the, there just isn't commissioning there for them for not because they haven't got a problem but just because it just isn't there. One of the other things that we often see people finding when they want treatment is that there are other barriers as well, things like people who might have an existing child from a previous relationship or BMI or smoking or ovarian reserve. Are all those things actually valid reasons not to offer them on treatment? There's some validity in some of them. So, you know, if you're going to commission treatment, you want to be able to make sure that you are getting, if you like, value for money. So there has to be some cost effectiveness into that in order to, I guess, um, prioritize or make sure that you're treating the people who are most likely to be to help from that and if we're going to say well you know if you feel that IVF is something you want to do but your chance is tiny should that be commissioned then you so you can understand where the ovarian reserve part of it comes into it where the age limits come into it and NICE has given some instruction about that or some guidance about that um, and so that's fine um, BMI has been a big contentious thing and argument for having um, a reasonable BMI and I would add that smoking and alcohol and all the other things that go with that is that if we're going to help people in difficult circumstances to become pregnant you want to make sure that you're doing it when they're in as good condition for pregnancy as possible so that not only do you have a good chance of success or maximize the chance of success but also that they have the best chance of having a healthy baby at the end of the day 
Um, and so there is an argument for some of those things. Obviously, we want people to have stopped smoking um, to moderate uh, or to, to look at their lifestyle factors. Um, and so uh, BMI comes into that, and, uh, but it is something that people struggle with, I think. What do you think people could actually do if they feel they should be eligible according to the NICE guidance, but actually in their local area, they're not being able to access treatment? Can they do anything about that? Um, they can apply to their commissioners um, if they believe that they have um, uh, something particular about them that means that they have an exceptional case, then you can put in an exceptional case request to local commissioners to ask for funding. Um, I'm not aware that very many of the times those are likely to be successful, um, particularly if they've already produced some guidance and you just fall out with that. Um, uh, the absolute case in point, for instance, would be the example you had before of somebody who's already got a child where um, commissioners don't feel they can fund for second children there are different restrictions around that about whether it's your child your partner's child partner child together adopted child all of those kind of things so different rules apply which help doesn't help either but um so some of those things probably wouldn't be looked at as as exceptional at all um if there are exceptional circumstances you can ask for that and the only other way of doing it would be just have a body a support group a, a body that that represents um a group of people to to try to push that um, if IVF isn't, if IVF isn't um, funded locally, should people still be able to get testing on the NHS? I feel very strongly that everybody should be able to get access to proper testing because um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, belief that IVF is the answer to everything and it isn't. It's uh, about half the people that we see in our fertility clinics won't actually either need or, or go down the IVF route. But I think it's really important for people to understand what's going on and to have those um, diagnostic things and get the diagnostic information or sometimes reassurance. So if you've been trying for a year and a half and everything's fine, actually you may have a, a very good ongoing cumulative pregnancy rate and you may not want to go down the route of treatment, but you can't know that. And one of the things that I think is really regrettable is people feeling that they're having to fight for something, having to push for something or not getting or looking back and saying I was never offered this when in fact maybe they didn't need it anyway and so I, I feel really strongly that people should be able to get from their GPs a referral to an expert who can give them proper advice, proper diagnostic information, allow them to understand what's going wrong, reassure them if everything's okay and then talk about what treatments are appropriate for them for which they then need to get whatever access they can and that's the crux of it after that. And would that apply for secondary infertility for people who've already got a child? Should they be able to have access to it? Absolutely, testing? definitely, because it's the same problem. You don't want people sitting for the rest of their lives saying, well, what if I couldn't get that? So, you know, if, if, if I'd known this, I could have done something else. I think I, it, it just doesn't, it just isn't reasonable. So I think, yes, everybody should have that conversation. We'll quite often see older women in our clinic whom we aren't going to be able to offer treatment because they're already of an age where perhaps that's not... Um, going to be feasible if, or they've got a restricted over in reserve IVF is not going to be something that we can offer them even though they might have a, a proven fertility problem but I want to have that conversation with them so that they understand that that would have been but in these circumstances it's actually not an okay thing to do but there are perhaps other things that they can look at and different ways of, of running their lives for future if you like and and so they're not looking back thinking with regret or, 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 or frustration really that, that they haven't been able to explore all of those things or at least get good advice. Because we do sometimes hear from people that GPs say, oh, well, you know, you can't have IVF here, so that's the end and we won't refer you for anything. But people should actually argue about that, should they? Well, I would. <laughs> I would say, well, you know, that, that doesn't mean... So I, I, I'm not sure how commissioners write their documents, and there may be that in some places that actually the restriction is indeed that. Um, you know, if you're not eligible for the ultimate treatment, then you can't even have the advice. But I think that would be a peculiar thing to do to people. And I think it would, it would be regrettable and, and shouldn't really be the thing. The difficulty then is getting to a specialist clinic. Um, quite a lot of times people will go to, uh, will be referred to general gynae clinics. That's fine. Um, you'll get that investigation and things done from there. But it's getting then that specialist advice after that. So we would hope that gynae clinic and, and secondary care doctors will have a good resource to, to give that good advice as well. 
for people who do have to pay, private treatment can be really expensive. And how can people actually make sure that they get a good price or the best price that they can for that? Well, I think prices, obviously, it's a hugely important um, part of what people have, uh, 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 how they're making their decisions. But it's not necessarily what you would want to be the first decision making part of it. So, you know, you want to be comfortable with a clinic. You want to have been ref to have a, a recommendation, either a referral from your GP who knows the clinic or from secondary care or the tertiary care centre that knows the clinics. Um, but if push comes to shove, then you need to understand what those prices are. What what are you getting for your money, um, and um, and research a clinic as much as you can to make sure that 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 people understand that that's that it is. One of the other things we often hear from people is that there are lots of extra treatments that clinics are offering them. And how do people begin to make a decision about what to pay for and what not to pay for? Well, I think part of that is this discussion. Of um, and that, you know, perhaps then they, they're looking at this list of shopping list of things and think, well, you know, if I'm only going to give it one go, I just need to do everything. So let's just shove it all in. Um, and I, uh, that's not really the point. So I think if you want to understand about it, first of all, is having a really good conversation with um, a, a, an expert about what you need. If you're um, interested in some of those so-called add-ons, have a look at the HFEA website where they're describing some of those and, and, and the issues around some of them. And then also, I think if you're in a clinic and people are talking to you about those things, do not believe that the, the extra bits that are all there make the treatment better for everybody. I think there's this sort of thing, well, if we sometimes get said this in the NHS clinic, well, if you were a private clinic, I could do this and it would be better. Well, no, but um, there may be particular circumstances for particular people where some things are uh, helpful, but it's not a question of you having to look at the shopping list and say, well, I can afford that, so I'll have it. So you really, really need to question a clinic about why they might be offering those things to you, what it is you might gain from it. And if it's only a might, then that's not necessarily something that you need at all. Um, and so I think being very circumspect about those kind of things, um, looking at what evidence is there, and there is some evidence out in the public domain that you resources in the public domain that you can look at to understand those things brilliant thanks um we know that outcomes can be different for um some age groups and we know that age does make a difference but does ethnicity make a difference as well to the outcomes of the treatment i think it undoubtedly does i think we probably haven't got as much research as we should have around that um, there are lots of reasons why that might be. Um, there may be cultural things. It might be to do with timing of when people present and how long they've tried for before, before presenting. It might be to do background health issues. Um, we recognise very well, for instance, that um, in the Asian population, BMI measurements are, are, have to be scaled down and maybe we're not making allowances for that in, a, in, in an appropriate way. There's a whole lot of things that might feed into that. Um, so, so the answer is that there may well be cultural um, and ethnicity issues that have a difference. Um, but I think more than anything, it, it access. Um, I think people in some of those groups may find it harder to get access. There are language barriers sometimes that make it difficult for people to um, make the arguments that perhaps other people would when, it's, when they have to make an argument when there's not an easy route of referral. One of the other things we often hear about as well is the shortage of egg and sperm donors for people from ethnic minority communities. I mean, is that something you experience as being a real problem? Um, yes, in that um, I can think of probably very few occasions when certainly in our region we've had anything other than Caucasian altruistic donors come forward. And we're always keen, obviously, to have them. Uh, I think that, again, goes back to perhaps cultural differences. Um, in some of the big metropolises where there's bigger populations, then then it's perhaps a little easier, but it doesn't seem to be so straightforward. Um, quite a lot of people bring their own donors anyway, um, particularly for egg donation, um, and so sometimes that, that will resolve that problem for us. Um, but for altruistic donors, certainly um, where we are, that's it's a big problem. Do you think we need more research into this whole area of some of those differences of outcomes and of people's access? Because it seems to be something that we don't really know a great deal about. 
I, I think that's true. I think we make some big assumptions, don't we? And, and uh, I think that there probably is room to understand an awful lot more about it. And are there also issues of access for the LGBT plus community? Yes, and there has been over a long period of time, of course, because um, uh, well, for all sorts of reasons. And it, I think, thankfully, in many places, that is catching up. Um, there are commissioners who will commission treatment in some circumstances, but uh, I think there are still significant differences. Um, uh, the, I suppose one example would be that if you're in a heterosexual couple and the man has no sperm, then you would get access to NHS donor treatment if you're a, in, in a lesbian relationship and, and sperm is required. For most places that won't happen, um, not until you have tried um, some cycles of insemination that you have, have um, paid for yourself would you then become eligible for NHS treatment on the basis that perhaps then there's a fertility problem behind it. Um, so lack of sperm in a heterosexual couple counts as a fertility problem, it doesn't otherwise. Do you find people sometimes are not using clinics because of that? Because they don't want to pay? Uh, yes, I think so. I think there's probably are people, certainly we see people who've started out down that route or perhaps have tried and then want to bring their, their, their own donor from outside back into the clinic to, to try to enhance that. But there's also recognition that from, well, certainly in our commissioning is that that those cycles of treatment have to have been in a licensed centre so that you know that they've been effective, that the sperm's good quality and that there is actually a genuine potential of a fertility problem for the woman that allows her then to get access for, for, for later treatment. And I suspect that's a, a, a relatively common thing. So to sum up, it seems that there are a lot of inequalities in access to treatment for lots of different people, depending on who they are and where they live, on all kinds of things to do with their physicality and their circumstances. What would you and what would the BFS actually like to see happen? I stand by saying, for personally, I, I would just like to see that in England, particularly, that everything was equitable and that we're not getting this postcode thing. Um, I admire what's happening in Scotland because they have brought their NHS centres together. They're trying to get a, a, a uniform approach and, and have managed that, I think, um, thus far well. That's about IVF and licensed treatment. But actually, um, one of the things that working in this area and looking at the, the, the issues people have had with access has demonstrated to me that is, is that is the question that you asked earlier about access to GPs, to, to secondary care, to invest, investigations. And I think having that equality also is enormously important and getting rid of those barriers so that people at least have an understanding about what their fertility issue is, so that they know what it is that they need, rather than having to, to look around to work it out for themselves. Um, so definitely getting rid of the, uh, the postcode lottery of things, but also ultimately um, making sure that people have access to good advice. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane Stewart. That was really, really helpful, Chair of the BFS, and thank you for your support for National Fertility Awareness Week. Definitely, yes. Thank you for inviting me.